We stand on the precipice of change, ladies and gentlemen. Throughout human history, we go through a number of paradigms. There are certain things that we take for granted. For example, just look back 100 years ago. No one would have ever questioned the concept of absolute time. But now we know that if I do this, time is going slower for me when I run than when I stand stationary. No one would have thought that to be true, but we know it now. What I want to talk to you today is about another paradigm which has been true for all life that we know thus far, and that is that 99.9% .9 of all species have gone extinct at some point, and that is because they only live on one planet. If the Velociraptors had a space program, they would probably still be around today, but we do. What I want to talk about today is about making ourselves a multiplanetary species, about the desire to live on Mars. So specifically, I want to talk about a program called Mars One. So how am I going to do this? I'll talk a little bit briefly about the Mars One timeline, the structure of its mission and the technology behind it. I'll then talk a little about what we might expect life will be like on Mars for the early Martian pioneers. And I'll talk about a few of the unique challenges we're going to have to overcome to be able to survive on Mars. I'll talk a little bit about my own personal experience of the astronaut selection process thus far and the training that we're going to have to go through during at least the eight years it takes leading up to the first human mission. And then what I'm really excited by is what the society on Mars will be like and the implications for people back on the Earth from doing this mission and this huge paradigm change that I mentioned. And then afterwards, out there in the lobby or wherever you are on the internet, send me questions. I want to answer all your questions because I can't do that in just a 15 minute talk. So how does the mission itself actually work? It started in 2013. Well, actually, 2011 was when it was initially founded. There were two people who founded it based in the Netherlands. Baz Lansdorp, who's the CEO, and Arno Wilders, who is the chief technical officer behind the organization. And their first step was to choose where, if we want to live on Mars, would we set up an outpost? And there's a number of trade-offs because you want to be close to the equator because it's quite warm there, and that means you have less thermal insulation required to keep yourself nice, warm, cozy, and alive. But you also need water in order to be able to have a self-sustaining settlement. You can't just be shipping all of your drinking water from the Earth all the time. That's never going to be self-sustaining. So the trade-off has selected this region that you can see up there in the Borealis Basin in the Northern Hemisphere, in Eastern Utopia Planetia or Western Arcadia Planetia. There's plenty of water there. It's not too cold, about, say, minus 50 or so degrees Celsius. Yeah, I mean, it does sound quite chilly, but there are places on the Earth that do go down that low quite often. Right, so how is this going to work? So 2013, anyone in the world could apply to it. It started in April 2013, when there were simultaneous press conferences in New York and in Shanghai announcing a private enterprise to go to Mars and that all you needed was to be over 18 and be physically fit and capable to do this mission. Apart from that, there were no real requirements just to be committed to doing this and to prove that you're capable of doing this. And it's been a very long process, which I'll be talking a little bit about later. The idea, though, is to whittle down those initial 200,000 people who applied to just 24 around the world by the end of this year, 2015. We're then going to go and start to train in a simulation outpost. As you can see up there, that is a concept sketch of what Simulation Outpost Alpha will look like. It's the first in a series of simulation outposts, which are going to be located in progressively harsher and more Mars-like environments, eventually leading up to an outpost in Antarctica in the years leading up to the final uh, preparation for the human mission. But whilst the first people are training for the mission to Mars, you need to lay the groundwork. You need to establish the technology and prove that it all works. And that all starts in 2018 with the demonstration lander and a communication satellite. The lander is currently being contracted to be worked on by Lockheed Martin over in the United States, who are most well known for sending NASA's Phoenix mission in 2007 to Mars, which this one is being based on. It's going to have a number of payloads to test technology we need to have humans living on Mars. Firstly, it's going to be extracting soil from the area around the lander. It's then going to be taking that soil and collecting water from it in order to demonstrate that we can make water on Mars and obviously test the purity of it to make sure it's drinkable. It's also going to be testing the electricity generation systems because we're going to try a type of solar panel that has never been tried on Mars before. And that's thin film solar panels, which is almost like paper in thinness because that's really light and it means you can cram loads of it into your spacecraft. It'll also have a video camera on board, which will be transmitting a live feed from the surface of Mars back to the Earth via the communication satellite. So anyone can tune in online and see what's happening on Mars today. 
So that's just to prove that a private entity can land on Mars. Where it gets interesting is in 2020 with the rover mission. This is not going to be a scientific rover like the ones have been pre-sent to Mars. This is a heavy-duty rover designed to land on Mars, find the eventual location of the settlement, check obviously that there's existing water a couple centimetres beneath the surface, and then activate a tracking beacon which is going to be used for the future missions. Because where it really gets serious is in 2022. That's when we start using one of the largest rockets since the Saturn V moon rocket. This is the Falcon Heavy. This is being built by SpaceX and should be going into its first test later this year. It will be able to lift around 50 tons or so into low Earth orbit, and we will need 13 of these in total to lead up to the first human mission. In total, six missions are going to land on Mars in 2022. There will be two supply units, two living units, and two life support units, and they'll land within about 10 kilometers or so of the rover, which is, I mean, it sounds quite uncertain, but that's significantly better than what you can do if you don't have some kind of rough target region to land on with a tracking beacon to help you. The rover will then drive over to each of the modules, bring them into the location of the settlement, and start to connect them all via hose and wires up to the life support system. It will then scoop up around 60 kilograms of Martian soil, put that into an oven module in the life support system to start the process of evaporating the subsurface ice and condensing it off as water. Once you have your water, you can then use the electricity from your solar panels to undergo the chemical process of electrolysis, which converts H2O into hydrogen and oxygen. And you can then store off your oxygen, combining it with nitrogen and argon from the Martian atmosphere to make your breathable air. And in total, after about a year or so, this is what you'd expect it to look like when the construction work is going on. A fully fledged settlement on the surface of Mars, but no humans just yet. About 70% of an Earth atmosphere inside of it, 120 kilograms of oxygen in storage, and 3,000 litres of water. And only then, when it's been functioning for an entire year, do you even consider sending the first human mission, departing in October 2024. You first send some engine modules into orbit. You then do more launches to send a transit habitat, which is going to dock with the engines. You send up an assembly crew in a Dragon capsule, also being built by SpaceX, to link them all together, just like how the International Space Station was established. The assembly crew will then descend back down to the Earth, and the first actual fully trained Mars 1 crew will launch into orbit. And one final check is done of all of the systems on Mars. And if the green light is given, you fire your engines catapulting off into interplanetary space for a seven-month journey to the Red Planet. Now, I'm not going to lie, it's going to be pretty harsh on that journey. We will be weightless. We won't be able to have showers or anything. You've got to use wet wipes. We have to exercise three hours every single day to stop our muscles and bones from degrading to the point that we can't even step out on Mars. We have to evacuate into radiation shelters if a solar particle then goes off from the sun. It's going to be hard, but we will persevere because we are going to our dream we are going to establish a new settlement on a new planet. And seven months of hardship certainly justifies that for me. Because where it gets exciting is April 2025, when the first humans finally touch down on Mars. They step out of the capsule after about 48 hours of a recovery period. They step off the platform and say the first words on Mars, being watched by four billion people around the world. And it's that event, that is the main reason why I want to do this, because I know that it can inspire young people to want to go into science, technology, engineering and maths all around the world. And it's that generation of inspired young people that will go on to tackle the huge problems we're going to face in the 21st century. But what happens after then? What happens when the first humans land and they're living there? What's life going to be like? So it's going to be quite a lot of construction work to begin with, expanding the settlement with the modules that land a couple weeks later for the eventual second crew. And the reason for this is that you double your living space, you also have four copies of the life support system, so that if anything goes wrong, the first crew can just move into the modules for the second crew, and they'll probably be fine until the second crew arrives in 2027. And from there, you send four more people every two years after that, until eventually we would like to hope we can build up a sustainable colony. That's the long-term goal for this. So what will life actually be like on the surface of Mars? So you can see here the concept of the actual settlement, and I've just done this to give you scale for how much solar panels we're going to need on Mars, because Mars receives a lot less light than the Earth receives. So we'll need around 3,000 square meters of solar panels, for example. And let's zoom in, let's zoom in and actually look in the settlement before we talk about a particular problem with having these solar arrays. Who would want to actually live in a place like this, with a lovely curved flat screen TV? Raise your hand if you'd like to live here. 
Oh, what? Okay, a lot of you seem to be taking things for granted on Earth. So we have a flat screen TV. We can communicate with our friends and families back on Earth, just with about a 40 minute communication delay at the worst. Let's zoom into the back room though, because there's some other interesting things. You can just see, just over there, some greenery. This is where we grow our own food. We are trying to make ourselves entirely self-sustaining in our food production, although if it fails for whatever reason, we do have a two-year supply of canned food. We'll be growing hydroponic... Yeah, I mean, it doesn't sound too nice, but two years until the next resupply shipment arrives. And who knows, canned chocolate cake might be quite nice, actually. Who knows? Anyway, so hydroponically grown vegetables will be the main source of our food. We will also have a small insect farm to provide us with protein, because you can't send cows and chickens to Mars. There's just nowhere near enough space for that. Right, so I mentioned the solar panels... And the big problem with using them for your power supply is that Mars undergoes global dust storms that can last for up to around 60 days when they take place. And your solar panels are worthless when that happens. You have to ration everything. You, have, you can't go outside, you can't do any EVAs, you have to turn down the water flow on your showers, dim the lights on the greenhouse, and conserve everything because you can't be wasting electricity producing new water and new oxygen, so you have to rely on what's in the storage tanks. And this is going to be extremely tough. But we've budgeted to say we have just enough supply that we should be able to last what we believe is the duration of the record dust storm. But it is going to be a harsh challenge. And I mentioned about going outside because there's another issue here that we don't really experience so much on the surface of Earth, which is radiation. Because Mars doesn't have a global magnetic field protecting it like our own planet does. So this means we have to coat the living units, which are inflatables at the back there, with about five metres of Martian soil to block out the radiation. Now, this is all fine, of course, when you're living in there, but if you go outside, you're being exposed to the full brunt, the harsh force of the protons streaming in from the sun. And this means you have to restrict your time outside to about three hours every three days or so in order to make it so that you have a working lifetime of 60 years on the surface of Mars before you exceed the standard astronaut career allowance associated with a 3% increase in the risk of getting cancer. So there are some restrictions, of course. You can't just go out and explore the surface freely initially. But it's all about laying the groundwork when we're doing here. We are the first crew going to construct things, maintain things, and lay the foundations for those crews that are going to follow and really build up a society on Mars. So how do we choose these people who are going to go? I mentioned that 200,000 originally applied back in 2013. We had to submit an online application, we had to submit a motivational video, a CV, a resume, and a psychologically profiling questionnaire, which was used as the basis to whittle us down to just 1,058 people from all across the world, from over 104 different countries, a truly international and apolitical mission. We had to have medical tests to prove that we're medically capable and fit to do this mission, no dependence on any kind of drugs or medication, because you obviously can't make those on Mars. We also had online interviews towards the end of last year, which was to assess our intelligence, our ability to creatively solve problems, and to check that we were really committed to a one-way trip I mean, one of the questions we were asked was, would you want to come back if 30 years from now, say, a, re a mission to return to the Earth became possible? And if you have any back of your mind, oh, it's all right, I can return one day, and it doesn't become possible, that lays the groundwork for psychological problems to develop, a feeling of betrayal that you can't return to your home planet. So only the people who want to go to Mars to live there for the rest of their lives have been selected. Now there are just 100 of us around the world, the Mars 100, and we're going to go for intensive group challenges over the rest of this year to demonstrate our suitability for this mission. So we're all going to get in together um, in the second half this year for a two-week-long residential, which will conclude with a simulation mission, which will whittle down the final 50 that pass the group challenges into the final 24, going to full-time astronaut training at the end of this year for the mission. So just the fact that I can say that I have almost a one in four chance of going to astronaut training that makes it more likely than me getting like a PhD place at the moment. So that, that's, a, that's a, very few people can say that. So it's very exciting. <laughs> this is just, I'll skip it. This is just to show the demographics. And these are the faces of the Mars 100. See if you can see me in there. I'm in the bottom right corner somewhere. So just want to talk briefly about the astronaut training that we have to do leading up. We'll be in groups of four people, two men and two women in each group. And ideally, each one will be from a different continent. To me, it's a truly international mission. We'll have to have technical training to give us all the skills we need, personal training to assess our psychology, and group training 
for up to three months each year in a simulation mission to make, basically to make sure that we don't go insane in those environments. Because if I'm going to go insane, I would much rather discover that on the Earth when I can then back out than after I'm on Mars a couple of years down the line. And that's one of the key aspects of training. And in fact, they encourage us to drop out at any point. They will try and drive us insane and to break us. Ultimately, they want to make Mars a paradise in comparison. So that if you had even the slightest thought of backing out, you would have backed out years previously. So I just want to conclude now with some ideas about why we're doing this. What is the long-term goal? Let's look, say, 50 years down the line, when we have a real community on Mars. How are we going to govern ourselves? What kind of political system do we have? How do we decide how we pass information on and educate the next generation? What happens when we have the first children on Mars? These are incredibly exciting questions, and we are going to be broadcasting this all so that anyone in the world can watch this. And if they see that somehow we manage to develop a society from scratch that deals with the problems that we have on Earth in a much more efficient and better way, that we manage to wipe out disease. Let's say we manage to stop the problem. Let's say there's no murder on Mars, for example, which I certainly hope would be the case. <laughs> we can really build a better world and by showing it to the people back home, I hope that we can make the Earth a better world too. And in the very, very long-term future, one of the primary reasons why I want to go there is because we know that Mars used to be a habitable planet. And I want to know whether we can make it a habitable planet again. This is the trillion dollar question. Can we build a second home for the human race? Can we apply our incredibly advanced techniques we've learned from altering our own atmosphere to do a lot of good on Mars? Because if we can cause climate change accidentally on Earth, what happens if we put our mind to it? Hmm. Yeah, see, this is where you can really see that I'm basically a crazy mad scientist. But yeah, this, this is the story that I want to tell you. We send people to Mars not just to eat up loads of money, not just because it would be cool or it would be for reality TV or anything. We send people to Mars for Earth, to bring ideas back to Earth, concepts back to Earth, and to bring scientists and engineers back to Earth who are inspired to make the world a better place. This is a mission for Earth, a mission for the human race, a mission for all of us. Thank you. <laughs>